Well, good morning, community. How are you feeling this morning? You guys sound great. A special welcome if you're joining us digitally. Uh, the last two weeks, I've been at our Lincoln Park location, but it always feels really, really good to be home, so I'm glad to be home. Uh, as we heard already, it's Thanksgiving week, right? So uh, a quick reminder to set your scales back 15 pounds in preparation for just the week of sweatpants that follows, right? Um, but I love Thanksgiving. It honestly is in my top two. I, lo- I mean, just look at this picture of a Thanksgiving Day spread, right? Anyone salivating already? It's, it's an entire holiday centered around eating. What's not to love? Now, I do realize, though, that when it comes to, like, Thanksgiving Day cuisine, we're not all totally aligned on that necessarily, but I keep hearing more and more people, this year more than ever, talking about pumpkin pie. Any pumpkin pie lovers in the house, anyone? Okay, cheers, audibly, that's wonderful. Um, and I, I like pumpkin pie, but personally, I think this is the best way to eat pumpkin pie, is like this. I think that is... <laughs> I like pumpkin pie, I like whipped cream more. Um, but you, you can't really talk Thanksgiving without talking the turkey, right? Turkey, arguably the most overrated meat of all time, but that's a talk for another time. We really, really have this thing for turkey, and it's the centerpiece of our entire meal. It has this really, really important place at the Thanksgiving Day meal. In fact, did you know that 91% of households will serve a turkey this Thanksgiving? In fact, there's a butterball hotline based right here in Naperville. I don't know if you knew that. And their whole purpose is to sort of field people's turkey-related questions. There was one guy that called, and he said that he had, uh, he had cut his turkey in half with his chainsaw, and he was wondering if the oil from the chainsaw would affect the flavor. Um, <laughs> there was another woman who called, and she was really disappointed that her turkey didn't have any breast meat until she realized that she had it upside down. Um, <laughs> one guy called just to sort of brag that he, uh, he had wrapped his turkey in a towel and jumped on it till all the bones broke so it would fit in the oven. We do really insane things for this one particular meal. In fact, uh, my friend Jeff Boris, arts director here at the Yellow Box, sent me this photo. I thought this would be a fun prank for all of us to play. If you want to pull out your smartphone and take a picture of this next photo here, um, just (laughs) post it online, send it to whoever's in charge of the turkey this year, and just like watch their brain explode, right? There's something about turkey, though, because there's something about a shared meal. There's something about gathering together to simply be together. I I love Thanksgiving not just for the food, but because it's like, it's an opportunity to hit pause on everything, you know? Amidst all the schedules and calendars and commitments, it's an opportunity to just, to breathe, to be grateful for all that we have, and yet we so quickly move past that, don't we? Thanksgiving, for a lot of us, is like a blip on the radar. In fact, I saw this advertisement a couple of years ago and see if you can determine the part that makes me crazy in the head. The Thanksgiving sale. Like, talk about missing the point, right? And who can forget Black Friday? I actually took this photo of an actual Black Friday shopper last year, and there he is. Um, <laughs> It's crazy, it's bonkers. In fact, for a couple years in high school, my brothers and I used to dress up like 70s distant runners and just go to Black Friday sales and just run across the aisles just for fun. And I've seen people do some insane things. A day after, a day after we all sat around a table and celebrated all the things that we already have, showing how grateful we are, we then wait in lines just to get one more thing, one more gadget, one more item. I think we know at some level that that doesn't actually satisfy. I think that we know that. In fact, there's a guy named uh, J.R.R. Tolkien who wrote The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. I think he put it brilliantly. He said, if more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. Does that resonate with anyone? If we had just a little more of being grateful for what we have, to take a deep breath, to hit pause amidst all the things that we're doing to simply be grateful, I think our world would be so much better off. We, we know that our happiness, our gratitude, isn't found in a better vacation or a bigger house or more stuff. And yet I think we really struggle to get there. So for our purposes this morning, I wanna give a simple definition of the word gratitude. Gratitude, simply put, 
is a framework. It's a way of seeing the world. I think every single human being is capable of gratitude because it's simply a framework, a way of seeing the world. Now, there's a, an author named John Ortberg, and he says gratitude requires three factors. Three factors that he calls the three bennies, not like Benny in the Jets. Three bennies are these three factors that lead us to have a posture of gratitude. Now, this word Benny is actually Latin for the word good. So he's saying there are three good things that we need to recognize, that we need sort of a, a, a lens shift sort of deep in our soul to experience gratitude. The first, he says, is benefit. Benefit. In order to be grateful, we need to recognize that we've received something good. In fact, the author of Psalms puts it this way, praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. Many of us feel exactly like that. Man, my life was in the pit. And crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things. Begins first with this posture that there are good things in our life. And some of you maybe have a harder time believing that this morning than others, but all of us have good things. Stuff that if we would slow down long enough and step back and say, man, that, I'm really grateful for that. I don't know where I would be without that person. And it doesn't mean that we won't still at times have unmet longings, but it's having eyes to say, oh, that's good. That's really good. The second Benny is benefactor. So if Benny is the word good, uh, factor is from the root word of, for the same word of factory. So it's something or someone who produces these good things. Gratitude recognizes where the good comes from. Now James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, I think puts it brilliantly. He says, don't be deceived, don't be duped, don't be fooled, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. He's saying, don't be duped into believing that we've earned all the good things in our life. That's a very common, very easy posture to assume. He's saying, don't, don't be fooled. Don't, don't be deceived. There, there is a Father who loves you, who sees you, who is taking care of you. And the third Benny is beneficiary. Grateful people, I believe, see themselves as beneficiaries. Again, David, the author of this song in particular says, when I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them? I want you to imagine him actually seeing this sprawling sky, right? Just being, any, have you ever just had your breath taken away looking at the night sky and thought how vast the universe, this God that spoke the world into existence knows me, knows you. Not just knows you, but knows the hairs on your head. God, what love is this that you would be responsible for all of this and that you would care about me and my heart and my dreams and my sorrows. Part, part of gratitude is recognizing that we are beneficiaries of good gifts. In fact, I think it's impossible to be grateful for something you feel entitled to. Does that resonate? If you feel like you're owed that, it's impossible to be grateful for it. But when we assume a posture of, God, who am I? Who am I that you would give me any of this? Even breath in my lungs right now, that that'll lead to gratitude. Gratitude is a product of a worldview. But feeling gratitude isn't everything, though. Feeling gratitude isn't everything. In fact, pastor and author Tim Keller, I think, puts it brilliantly. Here's how he says it. Next slide, please. He says, it's one thing to be grateful. It's another thing to give thanks. Gratitude is what you feel. Thanksgiving is what you do. Is that, does that resonate with anybody? Gratitude is a feeling, but gratitude is incomplete if it goes unexpressed. It's one thing to step back and say, oh man, there's some good stuff in my life and I'm grateful for that. The goal isn't for us to simply stop there with simply feeling gratitude, but to actually move us towards some sort of action. Like, for example, quick show of hands, who's gonna be responsible this next week for providing some kind of meal? Just a show of hands, who in this room 
Okay, would you guys look around at the people raising their hands? Can we show our appreciation for them right now, please? <laughs> and all that you have to do. Here's, here's my guess. You're gonna stand over a hot stove for God knows how long and you're gonna prepare all sorts of things. You're gonna get the fine china or the tablecloth or whatever that is and a bunch of people are gonna gather at your house. They're gonna stuff their faces full of food and hopefully, hopefully at the end of all of that, you'll hear them say these two faithful words. What are they? Thank you, right? Hopefully they don't just stuff their faces and then leave. Gratitude is incomplete if it goes unexpressed. It's the expression of gratitude that I think is absolutely critical, both in our human relationships, but I think the same is also true with God. In fact, if you look at the New Testament letters, these letters sent to the early church, instructing them on how to be the church, there's actually this consistent language of giving thanks, which I find so fascinating because out of all the things these early church writers could have chose to include, they said, hey, this gratitude thing, this thanksgiving thing, is actually really, really significant. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. He said, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always, what's it say? Giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And the apostle Paul said this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He's saying whether you're on the mountaintop or the pit of the valley, assume a posture of gratitude and thanksgiving. He writes to the Colossians, he says this, whatever you do, and I looked up the Greek there, it's actually whatever you do, whatever that is, wherever you find yourself, whether in word or in deed, do all of it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Over and over and over again, a hallmark of the early church is a stepping back and saying, God, who, who are we that you would be mindful of us to give us even another day to be alive, breath in our lungs, and everything that you've given is a gift that we're to steward well in the world. Gratitude is incomplete if it goes unexpressed. And so we're wrapping up this series called Breakthrough, but we believe that we are in a season of breakthrough. And I thought it was appropriate, kind of leading up to Thanksgiving, to not just not just to talk at you about gratitude and thanksgiving, but for us to actually do it. So the next 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna give three different props. Three different props about what God has done, what he's doing, and what he's going to do, and we're gonna actually pray. We're gonna actually ask God to stir in our hearts gratitude and thanksgiving for what he's done, what he's doing right now, and what he's going to do. Let's pray together. I thank you so much, first and foremost, that you are not a God who is distant or far, but that you are near. You are right in our midst right now. God, open our eyes to your presence at work in us and through us, both individually and as a family. God, may our gratitude not just simply remain a feeling. God, may we live that out as an action. We thank you, God, and we love you. We pray all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm gonna invite the ushers forward to begin passing the elements. And we call these elements a part of what's called the Lord's table, communion. At the core of that word is the word Eucharist, which means gift. Part of what we recognize at the communion table is the gift. Not just the gift of heaven when we die, but the gift of Jesus, the gift of each other, the gift of relationship. So I'm going to invite you as you receive the bread and the cup to eat and drink on your own whenever you're ready. To assume a posture that says, God, you didn't have to come after us. You didn't have to pursue us. You didn't have to send your only son into the world to die so that we might have peace with God and peace with others, but you did. This is so easy for us in Christianity to sort of move past. But at the heart of the Christian story is a God who loved us so much. He said, I'd rather die than live without you. When we could do nothing to earn it on our own, no amount of righteous works, no amount of prayers, no amount of obedience could ever earn that place God comes after. 
He is the source of all good things in Jesus who lived, died, and then rose again. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're saying a lot of things, not the least of which is, God, thank you for who you are. So again, I wanna invite you to, to receive when you're ready, but I also wanna challenge you just individually to finish this sentence. God, I'm thankful for. I want you to really think about that question. What's a thing, big or small, that when you look over your shoulder, you say, man, God has been so good to me, or that thing was such a gift to me, that was such a blessing. What, what does it look like to assume a posture this morning, to not have our mind focused on the thing that we're going to, the stuff we have to buy, the stuff that still needs to be prepped, to say right now in this moment, God, I am so thankful for this. I'm so thankful, God. So when you're ready, eat the bread, his body, drink the cup, his blood. And just pray to yourself individually, God, thank you. I'm so thankful for, go ahead and pray now.
So we just pray, God, thank you for what you've done. Now I want us to spend just a couple of minutes praying about what God is doing right now. And again, my guess is for some of us, we're very keenly aware of what God's doing right now. But there are also plenty of us who are wondering, I can't see what God is doing right now in this season, in this space, in this relationship. Like the Apostle Paul, I think, put it best. He wrote this, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. It's as if he's saying, some of us in this room, maybe you feel like you're on top of the mountain right now. We offer gratitude to God, thanksgiving to God, thank you for this thing. But many of us this morning, we feel like we're in the pit of despair. Maybe you're not even out of place to say, God, thank you for what you're doing even if I can't see it. Maybe the prayer is, God, help me to be grateful. Help me to be thankful even here, even now, even in the midst of this. Now, this is a little different than what we normally maybe would do together, but I wanna, I wanna really challenge you for the next couple of minutes or so to just get into groups of three or four people. And maybe you've never prayed aloud before and that makes you uncomfortable if someone in that group would just sort of take the lead there, but just spend a couple of minutes, God, help me to be thankful, to be grateful for what it is that you're doing right here in my marriage, in my family, at my work, in my community. Right now, God, give me eyes to see what it is that you're doing and stir in my heart gratitude. Amidst all the noise of the world, God, help me to be thankful even in the midst of this. So get together, three or four people, someone take the lead and just pray aloud together. God, help me to be grateful. Help me to be thankful right here, right now. Let's pray together. my way back to God, I found a true sense of inner peace and a direction to live my life and show my kids how to live. I found hope. I found peace. I found grace. I found acceptance. I found peace, hope. When I found my way back to God, I found faith. I found peace in the chaos. I found a sense of purpose. When I found my way back to God, I found true freedom. I found a love that um, I've never experienced before. It's unconditional. It's consistent.
it's comforting. Um, there's, I mean, these are tears of joy. <laughs> but I think more than anything, I found God's love. And God's love transformed me and it changed how I looked at life. It changed how I made my decisions. It changed how I looked at the world. I was able to kind of accept grace and feel that connectedness and feel that the love from God. That grace is what's led me to that happiness, that peace, that acceptance of myself and my shortcomings. Even though every situation that I've been through has been chaotic, I know that with Christ, I'm always able to find peace. God loves me no matter what I do. I found a heart that I didn't know I had. I can love other people. Selfish, self-centered, insecure, fearful. That was the old day. Because when you find love that God has for you, you feel it. I found freedom in Christ. I found that I didn't have to be pent up in shame. I didn't have to be pent up in a past life. Accusations, all of that. All that was free. It was free and clear in Christ. And so you don't have to try to pretend and try to guard yourself. Jesus did it all. That's freedom. There was a God waiting for me that had his arms wide open and I didn't have to be perfect and I didn't have to fit any molds and he just took me as I was and that changed my life. I, lo I love, 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 love hearing stories like that. To me, we, so we prayed, God, thankful for what you've done, for what you're doing. Uh, but this last one, I want us to pray, God, help us be thankful to have gratitude for what you're going to do. And one of the ways that we show gratitude is by our posture with our stuff. It's by seeing everything that God's given us as a gift that we are to steward well in the world. That's our time, talent, and our resources. Everything that we have is a gift to us on loan that we're to steward well in the world. Many of you know that last week was our Commitment Sunday for Breakthrough, and if you haven't taken part in that yet, you still have an opportunity to. There's a table in the lobby and there's envelopes, and we're, we're looking to reach more kids, students, and adults, and also plant more churches. We're also taking the first 10% of those commitments, and applying them to the four teams of Celebration Generosity, and if you're, if you're interested in learning any more about any of that, I wanna encourage you to head to the lobby, but we also celebrate every single week something that we call giving back to God. People often ask me, why do you say back to God? And the reason is really, really simple. It's because we believe that it's all God's anyway. But whatever it is that we have, whatever gifts God's placed in you, whatever resources, whatever sphere of influence, whatever we have is a gift on loan to us from God and we wanna be generous. It's a posture of saying, God, you so love the world that you gave that when we give, when we're generous, we're, we're modeling the image and likeness of the God that we're made in. So in a moment, the ushers are gonna pass the buckets. I wanna encourage you to be generous, to be generous towards the Jesus mission of helping people find their way back to God. You can give in the moment, you can give online, you can give through the app the way that my family does. But that's one of the ways that I think we show gratitude and thanksgiving is by seeing everything that we have as a loan to us from God. So ushers, would you begin passing those buckets, please? And as we're thinking about this, this final piece, God, grateful for what you're going to do, I'm reminded of another passage where the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome. L listen to how he puts it. He says, that's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. He's saying it's, it's no contest. He said, the created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. I love that phrase, the joyful anticipation deepens. God, we're so grateful for what you've done as we look over our shoulder. We're so grateful for what you're doing in our midst. But God, we know that you're not done with us yet. With joyful anticipation, we look to the future, not just for us individually, but for us together as a family. God, what do you want to do in and through us? We're ready, we're open. God, would you deepen that joyful anticipation? 
So again, for just a couple of minutes, I want to challenge you, wherever you're at, whether you're joining us digitally or in this room right now, to find just a couple of people around you and say, God, I'm so thankful for what you're going to do. Open my eyes to the ways that you want to work in me and through me in the weeks and months ahead. Let's, let's pray together with deep, joyful anticipation that God is not done with us yet, that he's moving us somewhere, that he wants to continue to move in and through all of us. So find just a few people around you. Let's pray for our church family. Let's pray for what he's doing in us individually, that God would do something powerful in us going forward. Let's pray together. stand together. Let's pray uh, the words on the screen right now. Father, we want to be a praying people. Please transform us into a praying church. Draw us closer to you and each other during this season of breakthrough. Give us an openness to your Holy Spirit. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, amen.